Hi, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Beaker and Wrench Minicast. We're excited to have Zachary from Jars Cannabis. Our podcast today, Zach, has extensive experience in distillation and cultivating cannabis. In honor of Croctober, we're asking Zach all about cannabis cultivation, what it takes to start a cannabis farm, how to maintain the plant, and more. Uh, let's start off with a little bit about your background, Zach. Uh, tell us how long you've been in the industry and how you got into it. Yeah, my name is Zach Byram. Um, I'm from Phoenix originally. Um, spent some time in California starting a, a farm in Santa Barbara County um, with a good partner of mine. Um, we do outdoor and uh, mixed light greenhouse mainly. Um, we specialize in organic uh, organic cannabis, really structured to fresh frozen and extraction. So, um, you know, my background has been around 15 years in the industry um, from anywhere from retail management all the way through a direct lab director to cultivation um, director as well. So, um, yeah, I love the plant. You know, I'm really passionate about the plant from a young age and um, just really dove deep into the the physicality of it and the, you know, the, yeah, just the um, actual cultivation and development of the resin. So. Um, All right, let's take this opportunity. Do you want to plug jars? What does jars do? So jars is a, a dispenser, mainly dispensary retail locations out in Michigan, Colorado, and Arizona. Um, we specialize in our retail locations. We are now launching a vertical situation out in Arizona. So we have cultivation canopy as well as a, a 10,000 square foot extraction building that we're slowly phasing out. Um, Right now we do hydrocarbon and distillation um, with an ethanol extraction. Um, so we do a couple different extraction methods and then soon going into the mechanical separation side. So um, yeah, uh, we're out in Phoenix, Arizona, right by Sky Harbor Airport. And uh, we have 11 retail locations in Arizona and there's about 20 plus in the other states as well. Nice. And, and I don't know if you mentioned this, but how did you start getting in, uh, cultivating cannabis? So as a caregiver, um, in the early 2012, 2013, um, you know, I got into uh, with a buddy out here in Arizona. We um, we did a caregiver grow, which uh, was all under the medical um, structure that Arizona uh, did. And then once dispensaries kind of became um, operable, we were able to kind of move our uh, flower into the into the dispensary realm until you know they kind of developed the the licensing that gave the cultivation opportunities out here. So um, started in the caregiver, moved up slowly through multiple indoor facilities, and then, you know, really scaled up uh, in 2017 and 18 when we uh, did the outdoor farm in Santa Barbara County, which uh, went from about anywhere from about 80,000 square feet total. And then that farm took us to 160 plus thousand square feet total wow. of canopy. That's amazing. Uh, do you have any advice for people looking to get into the business? Like if you're starting to start out, what would you, what would you tell everyone? Um, if you're looking for the cultivation realm, um, definitely you just have to kind of get in there and do it. You have to uh, not overthink a lot of the things that a lot of people may kind of put in front of you. Um, you know, really just focus on the environment and the cleanliness of your, you know, of your surrounding areas, wherever you are cultivating, rather than, you know, all the nutrients and the inputs that you're going to, you know, flood into the plant. So, you know, the plant loves to take up what it likes and when it likes it. So, um, you know, there's a lot of variations of cultivation, whether you're inside doing, you know, a very crop steering method with like rock wool and you're really trying to you know time your water uh irrigation to a specific you know time throughout the day whereas if you're more outdoor or greenhouse you might be in like raised beds with an organic you know kind of medium such as uh, a living soil or something like that where you're really just feeding the soil rather than the plant and the plant is just taking up all the nutrients necessary um from that soil medium so you know, there's a lot of different realms in that in that area that, uh, you know, there's not a wrong or a right, but it's kind of finding your style and what you believe in, whether that is the organic road or whether that's more synthetic. And, you know, really just sticking to it and understanding the plant rather than, um, you know, all the 
all the media and the marketing going in behind a lot of these products. You know, the plant's going to tell you what it likes and what it doesn't like. And, and, you know, it really just comes in experience and spending time at the plant. Tell me about some of the, like, the beginner mistakes you made, like learning everything you just told us. Um, you know, there's a lot. It's just, it comes from, you know, when you're scaling up, it's really important to understand the the goal and what you're trying to output before you, you know, really make the size, the scalable size. Um, make sure that you're not going to overextend, you know, yourself in those realms. I think that when cannabis went recreational, there was a lot of running into the market and everybody kind of trying to do as much as they possibly can. And I don't necessarily think that that was the best move for a lot of people's positions. Um, you know, it, it's just cultivation is a lot of work and it takes a lot of labor to get the plant from start to finish, um, especially in those outdoor areas where you're spending, you know, four to six months on one crop, you know, from July all the way to October, you know, you're really putting all your energy into one one crop that has to go great. If it doesn't, you know, you're going to have, you know, a, lo a loss that you don't really want. And then, you know, just making sure you're trimming the fat and keeping your costs low on something that you're scaling as well and not, you know, creating a huge overhead where you're not going to get that output at the end of the day. So I think, um, you know, scaling to the right size is a huge, uh, a huge um, one. And then also just making sure that you focus on quality, you know, quality will always sell. It's hard to, you know, push out, you know, thousands of pounds of something that doesn't really make it market adjustable for an extractor, for, you know, a distro, for anything. So I think, you know, really just the scalability and then focusing on quality is the two things that I can really say will keep you in the game for uh, like yeah, a good period of time. The, the scalability issue, like that's always, like literally the first question out of my mouth whenever I'm talking to someone about like white film, right? Like totally unrelated is like, how much do you want to produce? Because if you know that you can design your process around it, you can get the right equipment for that scale and not spend a bunch of extra money or have something that's undersized and really bottlenecking your process. So really um, understanding your goals, I guess is and in the market. Yeah, it's huge. And I that, I think that that's where the disconnect has kind of been, you know, over the past few years is just, you know, maybe people like operators that have been operating for, you know, a substantial amount of years kind of mix in with, you know, investors and, you know, they have to be on the same page moving forward. You know, the everything looks great on paper when you're going through numbers and what's possible. But the reality of cultivation is it's big agriculture and you know, there's a lot of variables that can happen in a, in a night's sleep. So, you know, that, you know, really puts an impact on a farm. And, you know, a farm is really trying to struggle to stay alive at this point um, for a lot of people, just because the market value has gone so low um, that the cost to produce a pound is not really viable for where a lot of these pounds market prices are for volume. So, um, you know, again, it's uh, it's just an interesting time. but um, the scalability is a definitely an issue with oversaturation and people just overextending themselves. Yeah. And, and your other point, quality, like you can't move crap. You have to have something that's, that's worth buying. Otherwise, especially in a market that's so competitive, it's got to be a good tier. Uh, what were some of the resources that you found most helpful, like that, that you learned a lot from? Um, I think, you know, just mentors and people that, you know, I met down the way and just really just having that community. I think that cannabis is really built strongly on community and, you know, early days we were able to have these sessions and link up and really, you know, talk about, you know, tech and what's going on and how people are, you know, improving different, um, methods. And I think that, uh, early on, you know, that's where I gained most of the knowledge is just having those conversations that, you know, meets uh, with people that are just, you know, part of the culture that are trying to do their best and producing the best plant possible. And, you know, there's always like blogs and media and, you know, YouTube is a very valuable thing these days where you can search anything and pretty much get an idea or a direction on where you're at. But I think for the most part, it's been experience in the actual garden with, you know, maybe a mentor early days that's kind of just showing you why and what you're doing. And then, you know, having that hands on is kind of makes everything stick, you know, it, it's a lot easier than just reading a book and being like, 
Okay, well, you're seeing it. You're seeing how the plant's responding. You're seeing a lot of different things. So, so your suggestion is talk to real people, experience with real plants. Like just just go do it, talk to people. Yeah, it's very accessible now. You know, it's not like it was back in the day where it was hard to find. You know, somebody doing it. I mean, there's a lot of opportunity. Whether it's you know these one of a big a big farm or a big uh, cultivation or you know somewhere small that's just trying to keep it. It's just getting your foot in the door and meeting the right people, you know, talking to the right people that's gonna give you the right advice. Cool. All right, now for some quick technical questions. Uh, what kind of lights do you prefer? So right now, I definitely in the indoor realm prefer the LEDs. Um, you know, when you're lighting up a building, you're definitely saving a lot on your monthly costs, which is with the power. Um, the bulbs aren't as, you don't have to maintain and change those bulbs out as often as you do the HPSs. Um, I think as far as the growth patterns that you see from either, HPSs still hold a pretty valid space um, for yields and just quality overall. But I do believe LEDs are gaining a lot of traction over the years with the technology and with just the, you know, the go green and making sure that, you know, we're trying to make be as resourceful and regenerative as possible. I think that the LEDs have a space um, as these large, large facilities come online. Um, you know, there's pros and cons to both, but I, I definitely prefer LED indoor, and then I would maybe do HPS in like a mixed light scenario. Cool. Uh, and have you have any problems with the hot plate and beer oil? um not really personally in my farm i mean it's a huge issue in any of the cultivation space right now um you know especially with the nurseries and just how many cuts they move um on a monthly basis or a yearly basis it's just a lot of risk and liability on their end um but at the end of the day i don't really prefer to buy a lot of cuts from some of these nurseries i we do a lot of our own pheno hunts so we go from seed or we would, if we are bringing in a cut of any sort, we would make sure that it goes through an extensive quarantine, tested, and everything before it really hits our actual population. Um, but for the most part, we we are a pheno hunting farm, so we pop seed, we you know hand select those uh, those cultivars, and we then do our own um, our own propagation, you know, and never really sharing a lot of that uh, that those cuts. So. Gotcha. Actually, that brings me right to the next question. Uh, how do you germinate? Like, what, what's your uh, practice for that? Well, that's a great question. There's a million ways to skin a cat, as a lot of people would say. I think for the germination process, you can do, it's mainly just about keeping the seeds wet and damp and dark. And, you know, you want to make sure that the climate isn't super cold or super hot, but mainly just keeping them wet and in a dark space for 20 to 24 to 48 hours will definitely pop the pop the um tail out if it's going to you know actually pop um but you know you could put them in a water a cup of water a glass of water and you can cover it in a dark spot you could do anything to just keep them wet the whole time you don't want them to dry out that's the main thing if you if you allow them to dry out they're not going to they're not going to want to break out of the shell it's going to stay and remain pretty hard so if you can keep it wet and you let them rock in a dark place for 24 to 48 hours, they should all pop. And then you just write to uh, whatever medium you are. So if you're rock wool, you can put them into a, you know, a little rock wool cube. If you're going into soil, you can put them into a peat cube or something like that, or just an actual four by four with soil. And, you know, just keep that space moist. Don't want to overwater it and, you know, just let it, let it do its thing over the next, you know, month or so under like a 18 watt LED clone light or something like that. And then are there any nutrients that you add to that mix or? Um, not so much in the early days of, you know, that seed, I would do maybe like a light nitrogen and maybe like humic acid or something like that, um, that would just kind of give a little bit of microbiology to the uh to the soil and allow the roots to you know kind of start to spread um maybe some mycorrhiza or something like that um you could sprinkle in there but really just trying to keep that soil and for me it's mostly soil so it already has some nutrients in that medium so i'm really just trying to keep it wet and it's allowing that tap root to 
pick up whatever it needs to pick up to, you know, thrive. Once it starts to get about a couple inches tall, I will start giving it a light veg feed with um, just whatever we're doing, whether it's, uh, you know, something natural that we uh, kind of brewed up or if it's, you know, just a regular um, bottle nutrient. And, and you touched on this earlier that, that the cleanliness is super important. Uh, like what kind of like handling procedures uh, or like uh, equipment to use to like handle the plants? Um, no equipment really necessarily to handle the plants. We uh, do a lot of stuff by hand. Um, just make sure that our arms are protected from the plants, gloves every time we're touching any of the product. Um, we are meticulous about not really touching the flower and in itself when we're handling anything in the garden. So if we're defoliating or if we're doing any type of practice um, throughout its flower cycle, we're really cautious about, you know, where the resin is being produced and not really disturbing those areas too much. So, um, you know, it's just if you're using clippers or if you're using any type of tool, you want to make sure those are clean, you know, sterilized with ISO or anything like that that would uh, kill any type of, um, you know, germ or bacteria that could cause, you know, an infection or some type of uh, pathogen to the, to the plant. But, um, you know, the round surrounding areas, your floors, your lights, you know, all your dehumidifiers, your fans, all those things are really important to keep clean all the time, you know, every cycle. And is there anything besides just keeping everything spotless clean that you do to like control pests or pathogens? um pests we use a lot of uh beneficial insects so you know like trichogramma wasp um a few other uh small insects that are really um you know just little population army populations that are going to fight off anything that we would not want to see such as aphids um you know maybe thrips or uh you know a root aphid anything that would be um you know a problem or that could potentially, you know, uh, explode in population, we utilize beneficial insects to keep those populations at bay. Um, we are outdoor in greenhouse, so you can't really expect the, you know, the spring to do everything. You're always uh, exposed to, you know, those outside environments. So, um, you know, we really bank on in Santa Barbara County specifically, you know, certain times of the year where the ladybug populations are you know, heavy, we plant companion plants or anything like that, that they would like to kind of in, intrigue them into our greenhouse space and um, utilize our, you know, natural uh, ladybug population rather than bringing in those types of insects. But as far as like the wasps and the young or the little uh, microscopic ones, we use um, insectaries to really explode populations out and just make sure that our plants are, you know, kind of being protected Early veg, we may use um, a few different preventatives for microbials or any type of uh, pathogens, um, but it's very early and we don't really like to spray too much. So it's based mainly once uh, we get into any type of flowering realm, um, we're, we're dependent on the beneficials. Do you use the insects indoors too? Yeah, correct. Thanks. That's, that's really cool. I didn't know that you just like use so many insects to control those things yeah not so much ladybugs inside but like definitely like the satchels of like the trichogrammas they're, they're microscopic and they just they really just will go around and feed on anything that really isn't supposed to be there and um you know it really keeps the population at bay rather than it ever coming up and you know then having to knock everything down you just you never really have a problem and that's another thing about cannabis that a lot of people kind of are a misnomer is that as long as you have a pretty balanced environment and ecosystem, like, you know, the plant's gonna thrive and there's not a lot of uh, situations uh, with pests or anything that's going to become a problem just because, you know, everything's kind of in balance and checked and nothing's gonna explode one way or another to cause a, a detrimental problem. Are there any other tricks you use to like maximize the, the potency, the trichome production? Um, not really tricks. We just like to give the plant, you know, the optimal optimal amount of light um, when we have control of that. So, you know, in our mixed light, we're going to, you know, open the tarps in the morning, 
even if it's, you know, a little bit of a marine layer or cloudy, we will still um, open the tarps and turn on our HPSs just to give, you know, the natural light through the clouds as well as the supplemental light in the greenhouse. Once that marine layer burns off, we're able to kind of cut back our HPSs and just give it full sun for, you know, the amount of hours that we have full sun. And then as soon as the, you know, sun starts to set and we are kind of wrapping it up for the day, if we're in flower and need a couple more extra hours of light, we'll just, you know, black out the greenhouse and keep our HPSs on and we're able to, you know, rock, uh, rock our flower cycle for the 12-12. So um, other than that, you know, really just, focusing, I guess, microscopically on the resin rather than just looking at the canopy as like, um, you know, the whole flower, you really need like a jeweler's loop or something like that, where you can kind of see what the resin, uh, the trichome gland is like developing like on um, the size, the color, you know, if it's milky, if it's clear, when the right time to harvest is going to be a huge determining factor on how that uh, trichome gland um, looks and is in its maturity. So I think that really looking at it microscopically is a much easier way to determine um, proper times to pull the plant, depending on what your end goal is. For me, I've always been a mechanical separation um, realm. So I do a lot of water hash and, uh, you know, maybe dry sifting in the early days, but mostly just water extraction now. And, you know, I'm pulling that plant at a specific time it's going to get fresh froze and then we're going to be able to process that within the you know next 24 to 48 hours depending on you know the uh the harvest process and it's really dependent on when that trichome is ready so you know you kind of have to be ready to act when the plant's ready to act in order to harness that optimal time um especially for extraction you know it's really important that the timing and the the maturity of the plant there's no degradation to the cannabinoids um, when you're trying to pull those cannabinoids off that biomass. So, um. Speaking of extraction, um, I, I do want to get on that. And there's just so much in the cultivation. Like, thank you so much for sharing all of that detail. Like we might have to do like a whole nother episode to, to dig in further. Because um, I think that's really interesting. Uh, but speaking of the uh, extraction, like what, what, do, what products do you make from the bubble hash? Um, why do you like it um, as opposed to say like distillation? Um, I think I prefer that realm just because it's a very, um, it's a replication of what we're seeing in the, in the grow, you know? So like, you know, from a cultivator standpoint, I'm really trying to maximize what I'm taking from that live plant and what I can carry over into that and concentrate, whether it be extracted with hydrocarbon, water, ethanol, whatever the case may be, you're trying to pull everything that you can from that plant. And um, I think that the water hash gives the best, clearest representation of what that plant is true to flavor, smell, taste when it's live right before it comes off the stock. Um, I've, you know, I create full melt hash. So we have, you know, a real true um, unadulterated resin that I could, uh, that I could put out. And then I also, you know, would group those into various microns and we can press that and further filter out any um, of those, you know, gland, glandular heads and get the oil secretion to make the rosin. Um, and then, you know, rosin could be decarbed and, you know, put into pens. It could be dabbed. It could be uh, put into edibles um, once decarbed as well. So there's a lot of realms for the solventless products. Um, you know, I dabbled in everything. So I uh, managed uh, hydrocarbon, I managed distillation, I managed, you know, a lot of uh, the solventless. So I think that with distillation and um, that has its place and it's very specific to, you know, a cannabinoid or a specific thing that you're trying to remove from that plant as a singular. But when you're looking for something full spectrum, you're definitely looking for, you know, a live hydrocarbon or a live solventless product to give you that uh, that representation of that genetic. Gotcha. And then how'd you get into distillation? Um, I actually was part of a lab out in Needles, California in the early maybe 2017-18 era. Um, and we were doing some short path work there, uh, ethanol extraction. Um, it was still pretty rudimentary, you know, rotovap to uh, recover and then just straight to uh, short paths. So um, 
it was um interesting kind of going through that we did some co2 extraction um and then was doing some at the or distillation from that extract which is totally different than an ethanol you know extract a lot more um a lot more winterization and you know post processing that goes into the co2 side but uh you know i think that um yeah we had that part in that lab out in needles and it was always a uh an interesting realm you know never something that i devoted a ton of ton of time to but i definitely appreciate everything that i've gained and learned from the actual distillation process from a short path to a wiped film um, we currently run your six inch and it's been an absolute amazing addition to our lab so um out here we uh you know are doing anywhere from three to four liters of finished product um an hour uh through the six inch and we're you know ripping through a lot of trim out here in Arizona from greenhouses and um, various indoor facilities. So uh, it's been a blessing to, you know, just have developed through the years, watch all the technology and the, you know, the times change and easier ways to process and more efficient ways to process. And I think that that's more what I'm into rather than um, a specific type of extraction is just really making sure that we are doing every type of extraction the most efficiently and the best to our ability. So. Keep that quality. It's like no matter what you do, always do it the best you can. Absolutely, man. Absolutely. Do you have any final advice for someone looking to get into the industry? Um, it's a great industry and it's a lot of fun. And if you're some if it's something you're passionate about, I think that is definitely a it's worth the uh it's worth for, for you know going after it's worth uh, trying to find a space that you fit and that you're happy with and that you can uh be passionate about and enjoy every day going to work um that's one thing that i take away from the industry and i'm i never take for granted um that it's just something i love to do and you know if i wasn't doing this as an everyday occupation i think i would still be doing it you know just as a hobby as a hobbyist and so i'm very grateful to be able to wake up and do something that i do love and that i do think that you're putting a lot of good energy into the world and giving a lot of product and you know changing a lot of people's lives for the better um so you know i think that if it's something you're passionate about you need to definitely try to get into it now while um it's still a really emerging developing industry and uh yeah, learn the ins and outs and get in with good people, good partners, and, you know, just build from there. Thank you. Like, thank you for all the good advice and for your time. Everyone check out Jars Cannabis in Arizona. Uh, where can they find you on social? So I have an Instagram. Um, I go by only heads with a Z. So O-N-L-Y-H-E-A-D-Z. Um, and I post some content up there. Instagram doesn't always like all the cannabis content so uh i'm not as active as i would like to be but you can always dm me on there we can uh, touch base and any questions that you guys may have i'm happy to answer and give you any advice i can amazing thank you so much again for your time and for the amazing advice as always you can find beaker and wrench on instagram at beaker and wrench and check out our youtube for more information and we really appreciate you zach and jars cannabis thank you so much thanks asa it's a pleasure and uh i hope to talk soon and